Hi guys, in this video I'm going to cover chi-square test of independence. We're also going to learn about two-way tables in the process and eventually get to the hypothesis test which is the chi-square test. Okay, so first off, two-way tables. This is an excellent way to summarize bivariate data where both of your variables are categorical. Remember that bivariate data, bi standing for two, variate implying variables, means that you have simultaneously collected data on each subject, two pieces of data, two variables. So for example, height and weight, that would be bivariate. So I randomly select 10 people and for each person I note their height and their weight. I have bivariate data. Okay. Now in that case, both those variables were numerical, quantitative. So now imagine a case where you have two categorical variables, qualitative variables. Okay. So let's say like uh, you have the individual's political affiliation and their sex. So there you have bivariate categorical data. So this is what I'm talking about and this is what we're going to be talking about in the case of uh, in, in this actually in this entire lecture. Okay, so uh, a great way to summarize data like this is with a two-way frequency table also sometimes called a contingency table or a cross tabulation cross tabs. These are all synonymous the two-way implies that there is two dimensions to this, one for each of the two variables in the bivariate data. You can have n-way tables, uh, which are more complex, but this is uh, most research it actually is probably being conducted on the level of the two-way frequency tables. Okay, these tables can be categorized by the number of rows they, they have and the number of columns. So oftentimes you'll hear them referred to as R by C tables, row X column. Okay, so if the smallest one you can possibly have is a two by two table, that will occur in a case where both of your categorical variables have two levels. So you end up with two rows by two columns. Okay, we're going to look at one of these tables shortly, but let's talk a little bit more about them. So on the way we're going to use these tables and the values you're going to see all over these tables can be broken up into these parts. So first off, you have observed cell counts. Observed cell counts are the number of times each combination of the two variables in question occur in the data set. So this is the observed counts from your sample data. Okay, they can't be changed. Then you have marginal totals. These are the totals at the end of the columns and at the end of the rows. So these tables will often have an extra column and an extra row where there are just the totals. They're on the margins, so we call them marginal totals. Then we have a grand total, a grand total, and it's off on the diagonal at the bottom right. You're going to take a look at one of these in a second. This is the total number of observations in your study. So the total number, the total sample size essentially, n. Okay. And then we have this ripple, which comes in only when you're doing some form of a chi-square or test or some hypothesis on the table. Then you have expected cell counts, okay? The expectation comes from the null hypothesis. So what this is, is the number of observations, not that you observed, but that you would have expected to observe in each combination if each, sorry, if the null hypothesis were true, okay? Now let's finally take a look at one of these tables and, and get a visual. So here's an example of bivariate data where we had level of education. So you can imagine this level of education and noxious habits. So let me just abbreviate these two like this. And we randomly sampled 585. So I can kind of, you can kind of tell that that's the grand total. So we randomly sampled 512, 
585 subjects, and we uh, took two pieces of information from each, the level of education and their noxious habits. or the no So <clears throat> we don't need to worry too much more about that. A great way to summarize this data is with this two-way table. So here's one dimension, noxious data, noxious habits, sorry. And then here's the second dimension, level of education. Level of education has two levels. Noxious habit has three levels. Okay, so we end up with a three by two contingency table. Okay, we could have also transposed these two variables and made made a two by three table it would not make the slightest bit of difference once you get a little bit more initiated in this space of chi-square tests there are some folks that would like there are some conventions as to where to put which variable but honestly it does not have any material difference okay now let's look at the contents of this two by three table here are the cells of the table let me highlight them in red these are the actual three by two cells so you see three rows two columns so we have six cells obviously okay there's a little legend down here so this one this kind of tells us what each of the numbers in each cell represents so by the way this is an example of a cell in this table so 93 is the observed number of subjects. If you recall that little data set I had over here, it's 93 of those subjects, of those rows in that original raw data had level of education, university, and noxious habits, one. So that's the combination of university and one for noxious habits. Okay, so you could think of this as the intersection between this event and this event. Okay, if you're thinking in terms of probability, and we're coming right off of a discussion in probability prior to this topic. Okay, um, what's next? The expected cell count. I'm using the legend here. There's other ways to do this, but as long as there's a legend that, that directs us. The expected cell counts, for now, I'm just going to repeat the definition of it. It's the number out of the 585 that you would expect to have level of education university and noxious habits one. So you can see that the expectation under the null hypothesis of the chi-square test of independence is different than the observed number that we saw from our data set. Okay, and then I'm going to leave this last guy off, this 3.18. We're going to get there later, and we'll come back to this, okay? And then you, basically everything I talked about, you can see throughout all the other cells, the observes and the expecteds, okay? Now, what do we have here? We have a totals. If you want to be completely accurate, these are marginal totals, okay? These are the marginal totals. 125 is the sum of 93 and 32. 303 is the sum of 197 and 106. By the way, the expected cell counts will also always add up to the same number as well. Okay, and you see 157 is 72 plus 85. And going this way, the marginal total, 362, is 93 plus 197 plus 72, and we get 362. Same goes for 223. That's the marginal total for level of education so if i look at 223 what does that mean to me practically that means out of the 585 223 had second as their level of education irregardless of their noxious habit and then finally we have the grand total which is what i started with on the diagonal here this is the total number of subjects you can get to this number by either adding this marginal total these marginal totals or all the cells. You'll get 585 either way. Okay, <clears throat> now let's move forward with the chi-square test. Now the chi-square test for independence of two categorical variables. What this test does is it looks for 
Um, so basically the, the way it's structured, let's start with that. We're looking at a single random sample from a single population. Okay, so we have some population we want to study. We take a single random sample from it. Okay, from each of the subjects, we collect two variables, hence bivariate data. Both of these variables must be categorical. Okay, so I'm here. Now, recall from some probability that we've done in the past that independence between two events, let's say A and B, being two arbitrary events, can be verified or shown by showing that the intersection is a product of the marginals. Okay? Remember this was one way that we learned in the probability lecture on independence to check for independence. This was one way we learned to check for independence. I'm just simply reminding you because uh, oftentimes statistics depends on probability and that's why I put that topic directly before this one okay a categorical variables levels can be seen as events so start looking at the levels of a categorical variable like level of education has these two levels you could start looking at these two levels as events okay same with noxious habits this guy ha happened to have three events Okay, you can call this A, B, you can call this C, D, E, and then we could start talking about intersections. So this 93 here, that's the intersection of C and A. This cell right here is the intersection of D and A. Uh, this one is the intersection of E and B. What about this one? What about these margins? This is just C. This is just D. This is just E. Likewise, this marginal total here is just B, and that's just A. Notice the margins don't care about the other variable. Okay? Now, let's go back. In order for two categorical variables, I'm on the last bullet here. In order for two categorical variables to be independent, the above check for independence, this guy, the multiplication rule, must hold between each combination of levels of the two categorical variables. So we just looked at this example where we had six, uh, three, three by two tables, so we have six cells. So each of these cells represents a uh, intersection between the events of the two variables that we're studying. So each of these cells would have to pass that independence test that we learned, and I'm underlining again, in order for us to say that the two variables are independent. Okay, so let's take, an, let's take a look at, at this in action. So, uh, if I go back to my naming convention, so I call this event A, this event B. I'm just going to show this with one cell, C, D, and E. Okay, we just saw that this was the intersection of C and A, and we saw that this is, the, um, sorry, this is C, and this is a, we're going to need these components to show the case for one of these cells. This is cell 1, 1, row 1, column 1. Okay, so let's see. What's the probability of C and A? Well, basically what we're saying is from this data, if we were to randomly select one subject, what's the chance that they would have level of education university and noxious habit 1? Basically, this cell here c and a well let's just take a look 93 of them in this box that we're putting our hand into have university level and noxious habit one out of 585 the grand total so the probability would be 93 over 585 okay great what about What's the probability that we put our hand into this box of 585 uh, subjects that we collected data on 
and we get a person that has a noxious habit of one. Notice I didn't ask, I didn't specify the level of education, only the noxious habit. So we're looking at this margin, 125 over 585. And final piece that we need here, what's the probability that I put my hand into this box and I select a subject that has level of education university, essentially not caring about the noxious habits. So essentially I'm asking what's the probability of A? And we see that 362 subjects had level of education university and that's it. We didn't care about their noxious habit. So the probability would be 362 over 585. Now, what probability theory tells us is that if this event, university, which we're calling A, and this event, one, which the noxious habit being one, which we're calling C. So basically, if C and A are in, truly independent, then the probability of their intersection, which we got up here, is going to equal the product of their marginal probabilities. And you see why they're called marginal probabilities. We looked at the margins of this table, right? Okay. Now let's check that. Just do a quick calculation and you'll see that they do not equal. Okay. Check that the probability of C and A, whether it equals, so I'll put a little circle here, we'll, we'll determine whether it equals the probability of C times the probability A, the product of the marginals. If you plug in these numbers that we have here, you're going to see that these do not equal, okay? It may be close, it may be far off, but does not equal. And oftentimes in practice, I mean, in practice, you're never <clears throat> going to get them to equal perfectly. Oh, it's very rare, okay? So what we essentially want to test is whether they're close enough so that we can conclude that they're not significantly different from independence. And that's what the chi-square test of independence is going to do. And it's not going to focus on just two of these events, but on all of these, in this case, six events, combinations that we can make, hence the six cells. If all of them together are not too far off independence, then we would conclude that these two variables are independent. If they're way off independence, in other words, this not equal to in collectively for all six of these cells becomes such a big number, a big difference, then we would conclude that level of education and noxious habits are not independent. They're dependent, which is very interesting actually result. Okay, now what are the expected cell counts now? Now we can discuss that. All right, so let's back off, go back to, go forward a little bit and then come back to, soon come back to expected cell counts. So by the way, the Greek letter chi, this is the chi-square test for independence. That's another way you can write it. The null hypothesis, very important, says that the two variables in question are independent. They do not inform one another. Knowing something about one of them doesn't tell you any information about the other one, both ways. Versus the alternative hypothesis that the two variables are not independent, or you could say that are, de are dependent. Meaning, if I know something about your level of education, it's going to tell me, it's going to give me some information that's going to be useful for me to try to predict your noxious habit. Okay, that would indicate in that would indicate dependence. Okay, naturally, we start from a position where we assume that two variables are independent. It's an, if you think it through logically, it makes sense. Let's start by assuming they have nothing to do with each other and then let the data show us whether they do or not. Okay, all right. So, going forward from there, when I say expected cell counts. It's expected under the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis, come back and read it, says that they are independent. And we studied independence and probability. Okay, the test statistic here is a chi-square test statistic, hence the chi-square test. 
basically what you're going to do is sum all the cells. We talked about what the cells were, right? In a three by two table, for example, there are six cells. So for each of those cells, you're going to take the observed cell count. So that's what I mean by O. Subtract the expected cell count. So you get the difference between the observed and the expected. You square that difference, then you divide by the expected. Okay, first square, then divide. Then you're going to take this number and add it up to the, the next cell and on and on and on. And that's what this is telling us. You're going to sum up all those. Okay. And that then you're going to get your chi-square test of independence. The bigger this number gets, generally speaking, the more proof there is that these two variables are not independent and that you're going to actually end up rejecting the null hypothesis. All right. Now, the expected cell counts, how do you arrive at them? So for each cell, cell by cell, you take the row total and the, uh, multiply it by the column total, divide by the grand total. So let's jump back to our data set. The row total, let's stick with this one cell. How do we arrive at 77.3? We take the row total, we multiply it by the column total. Notice when I say the row total, it's the row total for the cell that we're talking about. The column total for the cell that we're talking about over the grand total. Okay? The grand total is not going to change. If you compute this real quick side calculation, you're going to get 77.3. That's how we arrive at this number. Then you do it for this cell. How do you get this? The row total is 125. The column total now is 223. You do this for every single cell. And that's how you get the expected cell counts. Once you have all the ex expected cell counts, then you can compute the chi-square test, uh, the chi-square test statistic. Okay. Now, once you have all the expected cell counts, just do one quick check. Make sure all the expected cell counts are at least five. If they're at least five, then this test statistic that we just computed will follow a chi-square distribution with degrees of freedom given here. So the chi-square test is another one of those um, distributions in statistical inference that comes up all over the place. So, so far, if you've, uh, if you've been taking a stats course, you've probably learned about the standard normal distribution, the Z distribution, the T distribution, the student's distribution, those are synonymous, and... Um, now the chi-square test, uh, the chi-square distribution. The chi-square distribution has a parameter called degrees of freedom. And for this application, the way you arrive at the degrees of freedom is by taking the number of rows in your table, subtracting one, multiplying that by the number of columns subtracted by one. So for us, in our example, we had a three by two table, three rows, two columns. So the degrees of freedom is going to be simply arrived at by doing three minus one times two minus one. So we're going to end up with two times one and two degrees of freedom. Okay. Now, eventually we're going to use this value to go to a table. But before we do, let's go a little bit forward and look at how we're going to arrive at a conclusion in a test. So this chi-square test of independence is always going to be a one-sided test. So if you're used to doing hypothesis tests where you have to choose which tail your rejection region is going to be on, this one is very simple. It's always going to be a one-sided test and it's always going to be a right-sided rejection region. Okay, so I got a little picture here of a chi-square distribution with a certain number of degrees of freedom. You see it's always non-negative. Chi-square is always non-negative, so it's always greater than or equal to zero. Okay, And it's an example of a right skewed distribution, although as the degrees of freedom go up, this skew becomes less and less. Okay, So what we need to arrive at is a chi-square upper cutoff value. So that's what this chi-square u represents. This comes from a table and what this will do is will be the cutoff here and the upper tail 
that separates the rejection region from this area here, which if you like to call it the fail to reject region. Okay, Any chi-square value greater than this value, the chi-square u, will be in the rejection region and hence will cause you to reject the null hypothesis, which if you remember was that the two variables were independent. So if your chi-square value gets big, like I said before, you're getting more and more likely to reject the null. Here you see it visually. You're getting closer and closer, if not deeper and deeper, inside of the rejection region. But once you pass this chi-square u value, which comes from a table again, you reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Now let's take a look at uh, one of these tables. There are many tables, just like you're used to seeing many different versions of the tables for your Z table and your T table. Z table and T table, just like the chi-square table, are statistical tables with values from the said distribution. I have, a, I have an example of a very simple one that's going to get us the value that we need. So here it is. It's on the left. So you can ignore this on the right. This is a very simple version of a chi-square table. So basically what you need to do is two things. Choose the level of significance, so the alpha level for the test. This particular table contains values for 5% level of significance and 1% level of significance. Okay, so that will help you choose the column. Of course, you can have other levels of significance. And if you had something other than 1% or 5%, you would use a more complicated table, a more, uh, I should say, a more complete table okay, than this one. I would limit my examples to these two significance levels for simplicity's case. Okay. Next, you go in the first column and you have the degrees of freedom. And you go down until you hit your degrees of freedom. So let's just say for our test, we saw that the degrees of freedom was 2, right? And let's just say we were doing a chi-square test of independence, and I had set alpha to 5%, so 0.05. You need these two pieces of information. Then you could come to the table. You choose the correct column and the correct row, and you arrive at your chi-square upper critical value. So that is chi-square u. And that in this, for our example, is 5.99. Okay? Now let's take this and go back. Let's take that number and go back and see how that translates to this picture. That means that here we would have 5.99 as our cutoff. Of course, that wouldn't make sense with this number line here. This was just an arbitrary example I gave you. But basically, 5.99 would be the check. If our chi-square is greater than 5.99, then we would reject HO. And how do we get this guy? Well, this guy you get from your data. It's a lot of work, but that's what this formula here did. Okay, Comparing the observed cell counts to the expected cell counts. How do you get the expected cell counts? Once again, row total times column total over grand total forces each cell to have the correct number of observations under the null hypothesis. Basically, it creates a situation where every cell becomes perfectly independent. In other words, this guy and this guy for this cell are completely independent, these two events, with this count, the expected cell count. Okay. And now going back to here, you see that these values here, according to the legend, were the individual values that we need to get, the individual elements we need to get in order to compute the chi-square test statistic. Look at this. I've put a square around here. Compare it to this formula here. That's exactly the same thing, except this requires us to sum up all of those so there's going to be six of these for that example. So we're going to sum all those up. Okay, now let's jump into an example. All right, so a public poll surveyed 1,000 voters. So we took a random sample of 1,000 voters. Okay, we, the respondents were classified according to sex and voting preference. So we had bivariate categorical data. We summarized that data in a two-way table. It's a two-by-three contingency table. 
two rows, three columns. I stands for independent, R Republican, D Democrat. Okay, here are the observed cell counts. We're given them. Okay, we're not given the raw data in this case. We're given the observed cell counts summarized in this table. Okay, now what you need to do is get the expected cell counts one by one. Okay, put a, maybe stick them in this corner. Okay, get the marginal totals in the process, and you're gonna need you're gonna need all these values. Get the marginal totals, the grand total, and then answer this question: Are sex and voting preference independent? That's a chi-square test of independence. Alpha is five percent. So I'm gonna. You could pause here, give this example a shot. I'm going to go to the answers here. Okay, so once you get the marginal totals and the expected cell counts, of course the grand total as well, you formulate your null hypothesis to answer that question. Are these two variables independent? Well, the null hypothesis is going to be that sex, let's make this sex, and voting preference are independent versus the alternative that sex and voting preference are not independent. Significance level 0.05. Here are the expected cell counts. So check your expected cell counts against mine. How do I get 180? Just a quick check. I do the row total times the column total over the grand total. And that's how I get 180. If you get decimals in your expected cell counts, keep them. Don't read too much into it, but keep the expected cell counts. Do the expected cell counts for all the other cells. Check them out. They should all add up to the same rows and same column and same grand total. Once you have the table complete with the observes, the expected, the marginals, and the grand, compute the chi-square test statistic. So one by one, you're going to do, I'm going to do cell 1-1. One, one. 200 is the observed cell count, minus the expected cell count, which is 180, squared over the expected, as per the test statistic formula given on the previous slides. Okay? Or rewind on the video. You have access to the slides through the video. Okay? Get this value. Then you add this to the next cell. You do 150 minus 180 squared over 180. Then to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. In this case, you're going to have to do all six. You add them all up, and then you should arrive at 16.2. It takes a minute to do this. It's tedious, but it's simple math. OK? Then we get the chi-square u. Again, this is a two by three table so the degrees of freedom is going to be two alpha was given to us 0.05 so you go to the table and you should get 5.99 as the cutoff and then finally we're going to compare our chi-square test statistic to the upper cutoff and we're going to see that our chi-square test statistic is greater than the cutoff, so we reject the null hypothesis. We reject the statement that sex and voting preference are independent. We conclude that sex and voting preference are not independent. Okay. Another way to understand all this is that the observed cell counts, what we observed when we collected the data, and when compared to what we expected to observe, if the null hypothesis was true, is so different, okay, as measured by the test statistic, is so different, it's, the difference is so big between the observes and the expecteds collectively, that sex and voting preference cannot be independent, at least at this level of significance. Okay? All right. So this was an uh, introduction to chi-square test of independence, chi-square distribution, contingency tables, and the like. Hope this was helpful. 
Till next time, be sure to subscribe, like, and share. Have a great day.